Some talk of him as a saint, others as a troublemaker, vilely and self-seeking. At the still center of frequent controversy, praying in the shade of his favorite pipal tree, sits Sundalal Bahagur. He lives the austere life of an ascetic, but campaigns with the vigor of a well-seasoned politician, a man committed to a single objective, the saving of the Himalayan forests from the axe. Sundalal was born and lived his childhood in these forests. His father was a government forestry officer. And that's what Sundalal might have been had he not, at the tender age of 13, got caught up in politics. Those were the days when India was fighting to be independent of British imperial rule. He became a local activist for India's Congress party and at 17 spent a year in prison. Independence came in 1947. Under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi's Savodhya movement, the fiery young politician developed a more religious view of life. But for him, the Hindu reverence for nature was not just a moral imperative. Here in the hills, he saw it as something essential for human survival. The Himalayas one of the most magnificent and cruel wildernesses on earth, the traditional abode of the gods. The mountains teach us, said Rabindranath Tagore, the despair of the unreachable. But today, on their peaks, man has planted his flag, and into their foothills has brought development. True development means that uh, sustained development. Uh, whatever prosperity you see today, that is because man, our present day civilized man, has become the butcher of nature. And Himalaya is going down. Himalaya has started pelting stones. If you come here during the rainy season, you will find landslides everywhere, everywhere landslides, everywhere landslides. They look across to these hills, the old people of the village, and remember how it was. लकड़ी मिलती थी और अब जो है जंगल जब कट रहे हैं तो जंगल खाली हो गए हैं कहीं बारिश नहीं हो रही है बाढ़ चल रहे हैं और ये जमीन का भी कटाव हो रहा है जमीन का कटाव हो रहा है इसलिए हमें सारा नुकसान पहुंच रहा है इसलिए हम लकड़ी काटना बंद कर रहे हैं बड़े बड़े जाव रहते थे और हिरण रहते थे शिकार खेलते थे बड़े बड़े कस्तूरे रहते थे और यहां बगेरा रहते थे In these hills, people's ideas were confined by the humble assumption that man might manage nature, but not conquer it. I find those ideas in all the religions, in Buddhism, in uh, Christianity, in Islam, the basic things are the same. Uh, for example, in Hindu religion, we have been taught to respect nature to see ourselves in every living being, even in trees and in other things. In one of our religious books, it has been written that a tree is like ten suns. And I say that it does ten functions, important functions for things. The first is it gives us oxygen. Second is water. And the third is energy. And the fourth is food, fruits. And the fifth is clothes. 
and the sixth is shelter, timber for making wood, and the seventh is medicines, medicinal herbs, and the eighth thing is fodder to our cows, and the ninth thing is uh, flowers for worship, and the tenth thing is the shade as you are sitting under the shade of this tree. At least that's what the Himalayan forests used to provide, but today they don't. Sundalal believes it's because the needs of the local people have been made subordinate to those of the nation as a whole. For the people of the hills, new roads have meant easier access to hospitals, schools and markets. But they are a mixed blessing. For a start, many of them were built in a hurry. A border dispute with China in the early 60s meant India had to quickly secure its frontiers. They were also built relatively cheaply. India is not a rich country, and in spite of the formidable achievement of constructing anything in such difficult and dangerous terrain, the shoring up is often inadequate. The damage the road builders have left in their wake has provoked concern in the forestry department, and anger and frustration among the local people. Landslides like this from unconsolidated roads can mean ruin to a hill farmer with his small, steep terraced fields. And then there is the quarrying. These hills, once the home of tiger and leopard, are now mostly bare of both trees and even topsoil. The quarrier's work is random, uncontrolled and devastating. Denuded of tree cover, the loose rocks and other debris are swept down by the monsoon rains to block the age-old watercourses, creating a river of stone. The trees are cleared not just because of roads and quarries. They are cleared because they themselves are needed. Once these trees worked as the Himalayas' protective mantle, holding in place the thin topsoil enriched by the falling leaves. They soaked up the torrential monsoon rains, releasing them gently into the rivers. Now these trees are also being carried downstream to the hungry plains below, to be made into newsprint and railway sleepers, furniture for the domestic market and sports goods for export. The expanding industries of India cannot get enough. Today, demand outstrips supply. More than a century ago, those concerned with forests saw this coming. Yet so far, Sundalal would argue, Government has failed to stem the steady loss of tree cover. The politicians, they do not understand the seriousness of this. And for me, every living green tree in Himalaya is a century to save the country. I am thinking about the coming floods. What will happen? Every year the monsoon comes, and each year there is less and less to hold it back. The waters surge down into the plains of India, of Pakistan, of Bangladesh. The Yamuna, the Gandak, the Brahmaputra, the Indus, the mighty Ganga itself. This isn't just water, but millions of tons of good topsoil. And where soil goes, people will follow. The wealth of the Himalayas, they say, is disappearing into the Bay of Bengal. The Gangetic Plain is India's most densely populated area. Here, devastating floods are nothing new, but today their intensity and frequency is. It has become one of the first priorities for India's new Department of the Environment, Mr. N. D. Jayal. The Himalaya are a very young mountain range and very fragile. And to that extent, there is no doubt that they should receive very special treatment, that the, whatever development takes place is very carefully thought out so that it does the minimum harm to the entire ecosystem. Peter Wood of the Commonwealth Forestry Institute, Oxford. There are parts of the Himalayas which should never be cleared of trees at all. In fact, should not, one shouldn't attempt to have any form of agriculture on them 
in, in any way. Um, but one shouldn't um, perhaps overlook the fact that there are areas which are um, stable, flat, and can safely be used for agriculture, surrounded by protective forests um, above, perhaps, and below them. How, in fact, do the local people use the forests? In a village like Gaind, wealth is based on livestock, mainly cows and buffalo. But more recently, because they are such good scavengers, goats. They clamber up the slopes, eating the foliage of the broad leaf trees and the grasses. Sometimes, to control such random foraging, they keep their cattle tethered in the family compound. The villagers also get timber from the forests to build their houses. It's usually two sorts of hardwood, sal and teak. The bimal tree is used for rope making, or like the willow in Europe, for making baskets. Cheer pine, full of resin, makes a quickly ignitable torch or cooking fire. And from its charcoal, women will make kajo to accentuate the beauty of their eyes. The semel tree provides a soft kapok filling for bedspreads, and another tree supplies something more unusual, disposable plates. This is a medicinal tree. You might have heard about vasaka, syrup vasaka. That is a good medicine for cough and TB. In the past, the pundit, or local wise man, was teacher, fortune teller, and doctor all in one. He would travel from village to village dispensing the medicines he had prepared, not just from the trees, but from the flowers, the herbs, and the roots of the forest. They were tried and tested remedies within the pocket of the local people. Then there are the trees from which the villagers get food. The fruit are nut-bearing trees. Walnut, first priority. Second priority to chestnut. Third priority to trees giving edible seeds. Fourth priority, trees giving fruits. And fifth priority, trees giving honey. These supplement the staple diet of wheat or rice grown on the steep terraced slopes. In the past, it provided a simple, but substantial diet. You know, uh, 150 years back, our people were very prosperous because there were a very good natural forest. But today there is a problem. Gain's population has doubled in the past 45 years. In certain other parts of the world, the doubling time is twice that speed. This, combined with the increasing demand for commercial timber, means that the world's forests are now disappearing at the rate of 40 million acres a year, an area the size of England. What relevance does this have to us? Peter Wood. Britain is a country which I think is the greatest importing nation in the world. We import over 90% of our wood and wood product requirements, which is a colossal amount. Um, of course, we don't import direct from the Himalayas, but the impact of countries like Britain and Japan and other major importers is bound to be felt right up into mountain areas like that. And the amount of wood that we use and the amount of wood that is used in the world and is demanded by the richer nations is inevitably reducing the areas of tropical forest very rapidly. The price of timber, as anyone who's been to a do-it-yourself shop and, and tried to buy a piece, has moved very steeply and well, way ahead of inflation over the last 10 years, well ahead of inflation. But what for most people in this country only affects their pockets, in villages like Gaind, it is affecting their very survival. They attempt to construct their terraces even higher up the precipitous slopes. They cut down all but a few isolated trees until all that is left is the managed forest above, belonging to the forestry department. But without fodder for their cattle, and firewood for the hearth. What can they do? For two-thirds of the world, wood, not oil, is their main source of energy. And agriculture, their main means of livelihood. How much would this matter if progress provided an alternative? There is no electricity in Gaind yet, but there soon will be when the Terry Dam is built. What was once a footpath is now a road, and a fast exit route to the big world outside. There is no work in the hills, and you can't make any money out of agriculture. 
says Bhagwan Singh Rana. He was born and brought up in Gaind, but has come to Delhi, the capital, in search of a better life. Bhagwan and his wife, Pengla Devi, were married 15 years ago. Now he lives in a single room in a Delhi suburb, while his wife and children have returned to Gaind to look after their piece of land. The family cost less in the village, and he earns more in the town. Bhagwan is luckier than most. He has a job as a driver to the manager of an international computer firm. By working long hours of overtime, he can earn quite a respectable wage. When he returns home, which is for a few days, two or three times a year, he'll bring his wife money, about a hundred pounds. It is, of course, a familiar situation in poorer parts of the world, but it's not just that the family are apart. A whole attitude of mind has changed. For Bhagwan knows that his relative prosperity depends not on the cultivation of his fields, but on the maintenance of his job in the city. The subtle bond that once existed between man and nature is broken. It no longer seems relevant. For example, our Hindu culture, it believes uh, that a tree is a living being, is a deity, and our old sages and rishis sat under the trees to get the knowledge and to ponder over the problems of the mankind. He went uh, in with a feeling of worship near the tree, whereas our present man, our modern civilization, it goes with the axe near the tree just to take everything. In Rajasthan, a part of India very different from the Himalayas, there live the Vishnoese. They are a people who worship their trees. Compared to their neighbors, they are a prosperous people. Some say it's because they are clever traders. Others, because for hundreds of years, they have not only worshiped, but cherished their trees and their animals. In fact, their black buck are believed to harbor the spirit of their ancestors. No one is allowed to kill them, nor are their kejari trees allowed to be felled. Their place in Indian history goes back 250 years. It happened in 1730 that uh, as many as 363 people laid their lives uh, while protecting the trees. The Maharaja of Jodhpur, he needed some trees in order to burn the lime clean. Somebody told him that there are very good trees in Khejadi Bridge. So he sent his uh, minister with the X-Men to the village, and there was one lady. She was churning milk inside the house when she heard the sound of the X outside. Her name was Amrita Devi. Because custom decreed that no one must harm the trees, she ran out and threw her arms around them, only to be cut down by the X-Men. Inspired by her example, others followed until the slaughter was so dreadful and the people so resolute that the Maharaja called a halt. And so, to this day, the Vishnoese have maintained that special relationship with their trees. Or that is how the legend goes. Recently in India, it has been an inspiration for a new movement, the Chipko movement. It started back in the early 70s in the Himalayan district of Chamoli. From small beginnings in remote villages, its message has gone out to the whole of India and beyond. Chipko means in Hindi to hug, to embrace. It's proved a potent rallying cry. In village after village, the hill people have been doing what Amrita Devi once did, although happily without bloodshed. At first, they directed their protests against the contractors who were employed to fell the trees for the industries of the plains. Now, their argument is with the forest department. Their leaders, like Sundalal Bahaguna, are local people. They are not professional agitators from outside. It is primarily a woman's movement. This is Bimla, Sundalal's wife. It was she who drew her husband away from conventional politics into a Gandhian way of life, and eventually Chipko. It's a woman's movement because on their shoulders falls the real burden of the forest's steady decline. It is they who go even further afield to find fodder for their cattle. It is they who scavenge for firewood, and when they can't find it on the ground, must climb the trees to cut off the fresh branches. 
Now they are persuaded that this can't go on, neither this nor the commercial felling of trees, unless more is done to replace them. The Chipko movement didn't begin in this way. It began as an economic movement. The hill people saw what they considered to be their forests disappearing into the pulp mills and timber yards of the plains. If the forests are going to be cut down, shouldn't we, they asked, get something out of it? So let us have sawmills up in the hills and small village industries that we can manage ourselves. At first, Sundalal believed this too, but as time went by, he found that not only were the small industries established in the hills proving mainly uneconomic and in many cases inefficient, but that the loss of tree cover was so severe that such industries were no longer practicable. It changed his ideas completely. Many people say me that this is a man who at one time took the people to the forest and told them, come on, uh, we should chop the trees and we should do this sawing business. I myself went to the laborers because I told them that this is this forest is the source of our employment. Why should uh, laborers from outside come? But when I saw this thing that due to tree felling, so much what is happening, so much havoc is happening. Uh, the trees are being rolled down and the whole earth is being scratched off. Then my ideas were totally changed. Sundalal Bahaguna now represents the more radical faction of the Chipko movement. He believes that in the Himalayas above 3,000 feet, there should be no felling at all, either clear felling or selective felling, not at least until there is a return to 60% forest cover. If the people of the hills are to prosper and the people of the plains are to be protected from floods, he believes that this is essential. His stand has made a strong appeal to the young environmentalists. But others consider he has a somewhat Arcadian view of the forest, that his position is impractical and dangerously sentimental. It is this that has brought him into conflict with those who traditionally have managed the forests, the forestry department. This magnificent building is the Forestry Research Institute at Dehradun. It was established in the early 20s under the British Raj. Here, the senior officers of India's forestry department receive their training. The Indian Forestry Service was founded in the middle of the last century, many years before we in Britain established our own forestry commission. In fact, Britain's forestry commission was modeled on its imperial predecessor. It was a service that drew to it many brilliant and dedicated men, Indian and British alike. Henry Ford Robertson, was one of these, from 1924 until independence in 1947. Well, I think it's true to say, not only in India, but in any country with a, in the earlier days of the last century, that the forest was simply taken for granted. It was very often a majority crop. It was up for grabs, as the Americans would say, and you kept on taking it as you liked. And that's exactly what happened in the very early days of the Raj especially after the Indian mutiny. To administer the country more effectively, a massive program of railway building was initiated, which meant vast quantities of timber for sleepers. And the time comes, first locally and then more universal, when people stay for themselves, good heavens, there isn't enough forest here. We need the forest, we've always had them. And from that moment, the idea of conservation is born and maybe the idea of a forest department is born. And from this came a whole new way of regarding forests. The forester is not looking to the next election. He's looking to the future of the populace's children. It's cardinal in forestry that they take long views. And I'm sure there's still a devoted and well-trained forest service who wants to abide by that and is almost heartbroken if it cannot. There's nothing more uh, depressing that I know for a forest officer to see the things he's given his life to broken and stoop and build them up again with worn out tools to quote Kipling. I have had to, I have seen that myself. And it is usually ill-judged popular clamor for the immediate benefit. If anyone is to blame for overfelling and if it occurs, it'll be the politician and his pressures. If you have a growing population 
who are on subsistence agriculture, as they are in the hills, you will think of their immediate needs rather than their longer term needs. At the same time, how are the new industries to meet their needs? Unlike the people of the villages, they didn't need mixed forests, but monoculture, the growing of single species crops, usually pines, to provide a standardized supply of good commercial timber. Unfortunately, since this commercial forestry came, since this monoculture of pine came, everything has disappeared and we have become paupers. Bowls for yogurt and butter making. This village bowl turner sells most of them locally. The rest he takes to market. His lathe has always been run by this cost-free energy source. But today, in the Himalayas, first small streams, then rivers become dried up for increasingly long periods. Because without the sponge effect of the trees, the monsoon rains run off too fast. And that, Sundalal argues, is not only because of the lack of tree cover, but because of the type of tree cover. Cheer pines may be good for commerce, but not for conservation. He remembers what Richard St. Barr Baker, the grand old man of the trees, once said to a gathering of forestry officers. Look here, you have been given the dignified name of the conservators of the forest. You are not timber merchants. And uh, uh, since you have uh, constituted this forestry corporation, who is for felling the trees, you have prostituted forestry for short time economic ends. Now, some of your critics say, yes, you know, you criticize the forestry department's policy of uh, commercial forestry, mm. but that you ignore the fact that the villages, as population increases, are making very big encroachments on the forests. You know, being a Ghanaian, I believe in introspection, searching inside myself. And I am the son of a forester, so I have to think about it. Then I am son-in-law of a forester. And I myself have offered my services as on the forest guard. So I search inside myself that how far we have been as foresters responsible for this thing. And you know the villagers, the village people, these poor people, they had no alternative just to destroy the remaining trees when their old trees were perished, vanished. They, had to, they have no other, after all, they have to cook their meals, they have to feed their animal. O.N. Kohl is a government ecologist working at the Forest Research Institute, Dehradun. Well, I don't uh, think that uh, local people are not to blame because, uh, after all, it is the cattle of the local people go, who go in there and overgraze. It is they who cut the trees and uh, for their needs and all that. So entirely the local people are, uh, cannot be exonerated from not being blamed over the whole thing. But the forest department is giving them a practical lesson in forest destruction by chopping trees itself, showing them that trees are to be chopped. But what can the forestry department do? Future demand for commercial timber in India is projected to increase by 139% in just 20 years. One of the things they are trying to do is to introduce new techniques of cutting down trees more efficiently, less wastefully. Thus, all private contractor work, always open to abuse, has been taken over by a subsidiary of the forest department, the Forestry Corporation. One of the clients is the Star Paper Mills at Saharanpur, down in the plains. L. N. Chowdhury, its general manager, considers that felling techniques have improved. But does he find the forestry department's policies are working generally? Uh, I should say no, because forest corporation, as far as we are concerned, we give them the money and take the wood. But the replantation, reforestation is their headache, in which I think they have failed very miserably. Why is that, do you think? Uh, I think this, uh, the very uh, ineffectiveness of these such uh, corporations, you know. Can you enlarge on that a little? You see, these, uh, I should say, government-operated firms and the corporations, the people are not so much energetic 
as they should be. You know, because they get paid and that's what they think is their uh, ultimate thing in life. Today our education has alienated our officers from the people because they study in the big institutes, they study in the big universities and they know very little about the miseries and about the struggle of life uh, of the common people. Previously, there were no motor roads, so the forestry officers had to go either on foot or on the horseback. But now they run away on their jeeps. Another aspect of forest production taken over by the forest department is the tapping of resin, or lisa tapping as it is called in India. It was taken over for the same reason as timber felling. Originally it was done by private contractors, but it was claimed that they often overtapped the trees, sacrificing the forest's long-term interests for their own short-term gains. So now it is done by forestry department workers and distributed from forestry department depots to the various processing plants. But everybody knows that overtapping still goes on, not least the forestry officers themselves. Because they know, they told me, they whisper in my ear, Ki, we know that they, there will be no more trees within 20 years if we go on uh, taking, extracting resin out of these trees so cruelly. Mm. They, they know it, but uh, they are compelled, they have to give something. Sundalal considers that the pressure placed on the forestry department to earn revenue and the temptation for some of its officers to direct a bit of that revenue into their own pockets is one of the prime reasons for the forest's decline. The brief of our filming was not to investigate malpractice. There was neither time nor resources for this. But, as here in the Mandal Forest, we sometimes encountered disturbing contradictions. The Mandal Forest is a reserve forest with access forbidden to the public unless with permission of the forestry department. We were assured by officials that no tree felling happened here. And when we said we'd actually seen felling, as here, we were told that they were only dead trees. If that was the case, one could only assume that in certain areas at least, there were an awful lot of dead trees. Amongst the hill people, stories of official corruption abound. They spread with the speed of a forest fire, whether true, exaggerated, or totally absurd. Whatever their substance, the sad fact is that the villagers have little faith in either the ability or indeed the sincerity of the forestry department to maintain the forests. Forests that anyhow they still consider are theirs, not the government's. This distrust has proved fertile ground for the Chipko movement. <laughs> As usual, this particular Chipko meeting is mainly attended by women. But like the rest of our filming in the hills, there are also policemen, intelligent officers, and other government officials on hand. Suddenly, on an impulse, a Mr. Natani, a forestry officer, takes issue with the speakers. A dedicated and sincere man, it angers him to see the villagers resisting the department's attempts to protect the forest. जितने आप ये बता दीजिए की आप दो सौ आदमी बैठे हैं दो सौ पेड़ लगे इस इलाके में चलिए मैं छोड़ दूंगा लाइए कागज कल मेरे पास तीन पेन है लाइए कागज आप लाल से हैं, लाल से और नीले से नीले से मैं इस्तीफा भी लिखता हूँ अगर आप दो सौ आदमी बैठे हैं मुझे भी 200 पेड़ बता दे तीन आदमी ने 200 पेड़ लगाए हैं चलिए खेतों में देखिए फॉरेस्ट्री डिपार्टमेंट इन दिस पार्ट ऑफ द हिमालय फील्स इट सेल्फ बिलीगर 
Perhaps it's because, unlike other parts of India, such as Gujarat, they still see their job primarily as a policing exercise. That is, protecting the reserve forests from incursions by the local people, while developing more efficient ways to earn revenue from the industries of the plains. You know, these local people are the real forest guards. They are the protectors of the forest. And you cannot accept, uh, expect from a protector uh, that uh, you remain hungry, you do not take anything, and you look after this feast. A view that has not gone unheard in Mrs. Gandhi's new Department of the Environment, Mr. N. D. Jayal. The forest departments have been uh, devoting most of their energies towards the exploitation uh, aspects of forestry. And I think uh, that it has gone too much in that extreme, and I think the protective aspects have been uh, ignored. The other area in which they have not paid adequate attention is the social forestry that is meeting the needs of the people for their basic requirements of fuel, fodder, fertilizer, food, etc. And if it had uh, uh, taken both aspects, the ecological aspects as well as the uh, productive aspects of forestry, perhaps uh, we would not have been in the situation that we are today. If in the Himalayas there is a rift between the forestry department and the villages, what is Chipko doing in practical terms to help heal that rift? Many forestry officers feel bitter because they say Chipko is preventing the legitimate felling of trees while doing nothing about replanting new ones. Is this true? No. You know, we have got two sides of the Chipko movement. The first thing is that he stop felling of the trees because a tree uh, takes 40 years or so in order to grow. And the second thing I say, that plant tree. I say plant trees, I say plant trees on war footing. All the hill people should be employed in planting trees. And you will find there is a high school on the way. They are raising 8,000 such seedlings. Because today, the forestry department people have to bother for growing these uh, nurseries. Now, our slogan is that there should be nursery in every village and the children should take up this work. Children should fill this mud and manure in these bags. They should take these bags to their homes, put seeds in it. We have put seeds in it. And then after four or five months, the seedlings will come out. And in this way, you can have millions and millions of trees. This is the people's program for tree plantation and it can be done everywhere. You know our present day education, it teaches us only to use three fingers, and other seven fingers are useless. And we believe, the Gandhi believes, in the education of ten fingers. True education means education of head, training of head, hands and heart. All these three things should be combined together. And the training of hands is not complete till you use all the ten fingers. You know, the people are very conscious about their future. And when they regard forest as their means of livelihood or for their survival, they will look after the trees. Uh, unfortunately, our officers, they do not believe in the wisdom of the people and in their common sense. But if it could be demonstrated to be in their own self-interest, would the hill people cherish and sustain their forests? After all, Chipko's influence is still small, and it certainly hasn't happened yet. It was Sundalal's deeply held conviction that they would, given the right help and encouragement, that took him five and a half thousand miles to another great mountain area, the Alps, and the villages of Switzerland. It was a journey under the auspices of the World Wildlife Fund, his hosts, the Swiss Forestry Department. He came directly from Kenya, where Oxfam had arranged for him to attend the World Energy Conference. It was his first journey ever abroad. How would the gentle guru of the Himalayan hills be received by the hard-headed farmers of Opligan? 
These were men who for generations had been very much masters of their own forests. Yeah. We try yeah, yeah. this and we also do this thing. I want to tell you this yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is, we have to feel the heartbeats of the tree. Yes, because trees, a living being like us. I would also like to show you something which will explain what our movement is. <laughs> so I have got a thing with me. A problem of language, perhaps, but not of communication, not with Sundarlal's infectious enthusiasm. His guide and companion on this journey of inquiry was Andrea Speich of the Swiss Institute of Forest Research. I am in search of a solution. I am in search of the answers of the questions which we are facing, the problems which we are facing. Should we manage forests to meet the basic demands of the people? And I feel I don't mind raw material for industries, mm. but that comes later. Comes that later, is yes. the question yes. of priority. Mm. This is an essential difference between India and Switzerland. In a number of different ways, through communal cooperation and private forestry, the vast majority of forests are managed by the local people. The role of their forestry department is confined to coordination and technical advice. Indian forestry officers who have visited Switzerland are full of admiration for the way the people of this small, mountainous country look after their forests. But some of them seriously doubt whether Swiss management techniques could be applied to the Himalayas. They question whether their hill people could act with the same degree of responsibility and competence. Sundalal, like Gandhi before him, believes passionately that they can. Who should control the forest? Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Who you. should control the resources? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the spirit of democracy. Mm -hmm. And that is what Gandhiji wanted to do. Mm -hmm. He visualized a number of village republics mm -hmm. having control on their resources, mm -hmm. managing their own resources. And I think this is the secret of success of forests in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. But this responsibility you you spoke about uh, of local people in Switzerland it didn't come just like that we had also a, a destruction problem in forests yes. in the last century as we have many times during our it is not easy these days to think of the Swiss as poor people but not much more than a century ago they were especially those who lived up in the mountains it was a poverty directly related to the extensive cutting down of forests in the early days of Switzerland's industrialization those who struggled to make a living for themselves up in the alpine pastures suffered from the constant threat of avalanche in the way that the Himalayas today are threatened by flood. Some of the older farmers can remember those harsher days and characteristically it is these people, those who must make their living off the land rather than the officials that Sundalal insists on meeting. If we wouldn't have the forest, we wouldn't have any water. Yes, that, that, that is that is also our experience. And uh, he he thinks he couldn't breathe breathe if there wouldn't be a forest in this area. Yes, the air is, is very important. And that is that is what we feel because most of the people they feel people living down in the village and in big cities they feel that forest is for timber, forest is for raw material to the industries. But we the Highlanders, mountaineers, we feel that forest is for, for air, forest is for water, and forest is for soil. Mm -hmm. I love to be with the old people. Mm -hmm. And whatever I have learned, I have learned mostly from such people, mm -hmm. from villagers. You know what we are lacking today. We have too much of science, but no wisdom. Mm -hmm. And these people, those who have been in the close contact with nature, they have wisdom, and mm -hmm. wisdom is the collection of experiences of uh, generations. I get extra strength and energy from you. When I am in your company, I feel that I am a boy of 10 or 12 years, and I feel as young and fresh. This was the happiest day of my trip because I love to be with the children. 
they have the same feeling for nature. Mm -hmm. The Swiss today cut down no more trees than they can grow. This is indeed an enviable situation. In asking whether the people of the Himalayas, not only in India but in Pakistan, Nepal and the other smaller nations of this great mountain range can achieve the same objective requires that one acknowledges the considerable differences that exist. The Alps have an older, more stable, less dramatically precipitous mountain terrain. Their rainfall comes to them gently throughout the year, not in concentrated and relentless monsoon torrents. Above all, Switzerland has very nearly stabilized its population growth. I think I'm, I'm not quite confident about this and quite sure, but I think that in our Swiss type of silviculture, we have some kind of uh, equilibrium between economic aspects and conservation and... I do not think if there is any difference between economy and ecology. As a matter of fact, ecology is permanent economy. Mm -hmm. And right. you right. can uh, retain permanent economy only if you respect nature. Mm -hmm. And this is not the need of India alone, but mm -hmm. this is the need of many developing mm -hmm. countries. Yeah. And especially in the tropical areas where mm -hmm. there are some remaining forests and mm -hmm. which are fastly disappearing. Mm -hmm. I was in Nairobi and people told me, yes, we want Chipko movement in North America, mm -hmm. we want Chipko movement in Africa and in so many regions. One thing about which I am convinced and it has strengthened my ideas that people should have full control over the forest. Mm. It should be the village community who should manage the forest, who should control the forest, and they should decide. Mm. Today, Sundalal Bahaguna is making a 2,500 mile foot march along the whole extent of the Himalayas, teaching, encouraging, persuading. His battle for the forest continues. <laughs> <laughs> 